All right, friends, we will now hear from the word of God as it comes forth from John, the 21st chapter and the first 17 verses. We invite you to grab your Bible or whatever device you use for scripture reading and read along, or you can sit and listen to the word as I read it. John, the 21st chapter and the first 17 verses. This will be our focus scripture uh, for our conversation tonight. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. For this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. All right, friends. So tonight we see a New Testament story. Unlike Monday and Tuesday, where we were in the New Old Testament, we are looking at Jesus last days on earth after his resurrection and to be honest the disciples were exhausted by this point they were worn out they felt helpless they didn't know what to take or what to make of all of this they knew that Jesus had arisen from the dead they didn't know what would happen to them next and they knew that Jesus would soon be ascending it was a lot going on and they were exhausted, they were tired, they were scared, they were worried. And so Peter does something that a lot of us do when we're going through stress. A lot of us do this when we are having a bad day or when we're going through a tough season. Peter goes to the familiar. Now you remember on Monday night how the Israelites were saying, at least back in uh, Egypt, we didn't have these problems. They were going through a difficult time 
and they were longing for the familiar. Peter and the disciples needed something they were good at. They needed to feel something that they could uh, achieve. They needed something to make them feel good and take their minds off of some of the challenges and the problems they had. And so they said, you know what, let's go fishing. But that's not what happened. They felt worse because they went through the whole night fishing with nothing to show for it. Here again, we see another story of how little or how nothing ends up being the experience. With the people of Israel, they were worried that there was no bread to eat. With the widow at Zarephath, uh, she was worried that she wouldn't have enough after feeding Elijah so that she and her son could die peacefully in the horrible famine that they were experiencing. Now we have the disciples feeling the same weight of despair. At least they were good at fishing, they said to themselves. And Peter was an excellent fisherman, but not this time. He did not catch one single fish. And so it's after this that they encounter Jesus, who gives them instruction on where to get the fish. This whole fishing expedition, it was a form of really coping with grief, coping with loss, coping with their own sorrow. Sure enough, Jesus rose from the dead, but Jesus made it clear that this won't be what it was. I will, be assume, I will soon be returning to my father. I will soon be going back and you will have the responsibility to carry out the faith. I want us to look at this clip in which we find a woman who is also deeply grieving in the film 12 Years a Slave. It was about a freed uh, African-American man who was captured as he was mistaken to be a slave and for 12 years he was treated like a slave even though he was a free man and even though he never knew slavery, he only knew freedom in New York. So for 12 years, he was struggling to return to his place of liberation. He encounters a woman who lost a lot. She lost her own child during the slavery process. And I want you to take a look at this interaction between the two of them, and we'll be right back. Be overcome by sorrow, you will drown in it. Have you stopped crying for your children? You make no sounds, but will you ever let them go in your heart? They are as my flesh. Then who is distressed? Do I upset the master and the mistress? Do you care less about my loss than, than their well being? Master Ford is a decent man. He is a slaver. Under the circumstances. Under the circumstances, he is a slaver. Will you truckle at his boot? No. You luxuriate in his face. I survive. I will not fall into despair. I will offer up my talents to Master Ford. I will keep myself hardy till freedom is opportune. Oh, Ford is your opportunity. You think he does not know that you are more than you suggest, but he does nothing for you. Nothing. You are no better than prized livestock. Call for him. Call, tell him of your previous circumstances and see what it earns you, Solomon. So you settle into your role as Platt then? My back is thick with scars for protesting my freedom. Do not accuse me. I, I accuse you of nothing. I cannot accuse. I have done dishonorable things to survive. And for all of them, I have ended up here. No better than if I stood up for myself. God forgive me. Solomon, let me weep for my children. <laughs> so friends, we just saw a pretty gut-wrenching clip 
of a woman who's struggling to deal with so much loss, so much brutality and so much agony. Now the gentleman is trying his best to comfort her and to encourage her and to keep her moving forward. And they both have an interaction where they're really challenging their different forms of grief and coping. We are all called to experience grief in different ways. It just happens that way. Some of us cry, but crying is not a sign of weakness. And some of us choose to do different things with our time and with pieces of our lives in terms of moving forward. And that's not necessarily an experience of avoidance. We all have different ways of dealing and coping with grief. Peter and the disciples' way was to go fishing. And it was in the context of their grief and their loss, which was exemplified by them not even able to catch fish, even with an expert fisherman. It wasn't until Jesus shows up and offers them instruction and guidance and invites them to breakfast. This is what it means for God to provide. God provides for us also in our grief and in our sorrow in our sense of loss, in our difficulties, in those moments we need a voice the most, in those moments we need comfort the most, God provides. In the past uh, couple of stories from uh, the Exodus story where we're looking at the children of Israel struggling to be fed and to find comfort on the journey, or whether it's the story of Elijah and the widow, all of these stories have one common theme. God shows up in the midst of difficulty and struggle. And no matter what's happening on the outside, no matter whether it's a famine, whether it's moving from one place to the next, whether it's the journey from bondage to freedom, or whether it is the aftermath of loss and found as the disciples have experienced with the resurrection of Jesus. God provides. God shows up. Now the Israelites ate every single morning. Elijah and the widow, they ate every single morning. And now the disciples are offered breakfast by one who shows them where the fish is so much that they have a hard time getting that net on shore and gives them breakfast. That is Jesus. That is who Jesus is and that is what Jesus does. And so I want us to be mindful of our hardcore life-changing, life-transformative experiences. I want you to keep the faith when there seems to be darkness all around, or when you go through those seasons and absolutely nothing is working out, or you go through those times and it just seems like everything is uphill, I want you to be assured that you're not alone. God always shows up with a food truck and there is always a table and there's always food there for you to partake of, be it physical, be it spiritual, be it inspirational, be it guidance, God shows up with exactly what you need. Now, our three affirmation statements tonight, I want you to keep this in mind. And the first one is, Jesus will always meet me in my time of grief. Jesus will always meet me in my time of grief because you don't have to grieve alone and you don't have to avoid grief. It is necessary for our development as believers of him who is the Christ. The second statement is whether we, whether we cry or whether we choose to find other ways to cope, there is healing available to be experienced. You don't have to knock someone else's form of grieving and they don't have to knock yours. Jesus will always find you wherever you grieve and Jesus will wipe away every tear and offer you every ounce of comfort day by day. The same way they ate every morning, Jesus brings comfort every morning. You have to get through the night. You have to get through tough times and know that you go not alone. And the last one is, friends, 
be encouraged because there is always breakfast awaiting us in the morning. Again, the song says, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies we do see. All we need, God's hand hath provided for us. Great is thy faithfulness. Now I encourage you, my friends, to go forth knowing that you will be cared for, that the Lord provides, the Lord shows up with just what you need. The Lord is still a God of miracles, a God of possibilities. He brings people together. He leads people through difficulty. And he even comes to us after the worst has occurred to show us that he is still in control. He is still in charge and he is still making all things new. Thank you for this time together. God bless you and keep the faith. And don't turn back, always move forward. And there, God will be with you.